All right, it is 6 p.m., so we will get started. My name is Kyle Allred, and I am co-founder and course producer at medcram.com, and I'm here with Dr. Roger Schwelt, which many of you know. I'm going to bring in uh, Dr. Schwelt now. How you doing, Roger? Very good. Thanks, Kyle. Excellent. And for those who uh, have not met Dr. Schwelt before, he, is, he has four board certifications. You can see some of them on the wall behind him there. Um, internal medicine, pulmonary, sleep medicine, and uh, critical care. And he's also associate professor at um, UC Riverside in California. And um, I'll, I'll jump right in with the first question. Uh, Roger, how are things going in the ICU? You've been in the ICU all week. Uh, give us an update from the, uh, from, from the hospital there. Yeah, well, I think this is a good week. Uh, we've, we had a number of patients that were extubated. That's always good and fun to encourage our patients to get off the ventilator like we did. Um, yeah, I've been in the ICU uh, all week, and um, we've, we, we've, uh, we've definitely noticed that there's been an increase in the number of patients that are coming in, and that has to do with potentially opening um, the economy and things of that nature. But I think as opposed to where we were two months ago, we are prepared. We have systems in place. We understand what PPE is. That's personal protective equipment. We know how to don and doff. It's becoming more of a, a new normalcy. And so we're able to focus on what we need to be focusing on, which is the patients. So just got home a little while ago. And I have to tell you, I did my, uh, uh, contrast shower was in the spa there for a little bit. And, uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to go back and look at uh, our videos and our updates in terms of contrast showers and boosting immunity. And so, uh, yeah, I feel, I feel great. Excellent. And you mentioned PPE. Do you guys have plenty of PPE at this point? Yeah. What we're doing is we're conserving our PPE in certain ways. So for instance, N95 masks, which we have enough of, we are recycling them on a personal basis. So writing our name on them, they're going down and being sterilized. Um, but in terms of hair nets, in terms of face masks, eyewear protection, gowns, gloves, footwear, we've got plenty of that. And uh, not only that, at our hospital, which is uh, in Redlands, they've done an outstanding job of repurposing a lot of the staff that were not being used to help with that donning and doffing process. So for instance, phys speech therapists, physical therapists uh, were there as kind of PPE buddies, they called it. So they would watch you get the PPE on and off. And if you were about to make a mistake, they would, you know, they would tell you what to do. And so really we've all gone through this training where I know I've got it in my motor memory. Now it's getting to the point where they just kind of watch us and, you know, I, I tell them, okay, let me see if I can do it right this time without telling me. And then I start to do it. And, and, uh, you know, so, and it, it's just a routine that we get into. We come in, we hand sanitize. Uh, first thing we do is take off the, uh, the shower hat or the, uh, the hair net and we throw that away. Then we hand sanitize. Then we take off the, uh, the gown, roll that up into a ball, throw it away, hand sanitize. Then we take off the, uh, the surgical mask, leaving the N95 underneath on, throw that away, hand sanitize. Then we take off the boot covers, throw that away, hand sanitize, take the outside gloves off. And then we go into another room where we take off the mask and we put on gloves, wash that with soap. And then we uh, put it in a bin and then we hand sanitize and then we leave. So that's the process of, of doffing, and um, we've gotten it down so I can describe it now very easily because <laughs> I've done it so many times. It sounds time consuming. Um, yep. Well, let's get into some questions. We, we had a lot of great questions come in this week and uh, a lot of questions coming in now. So the first one, and we'll see if we can get it displayed on the screen here, is from Jack Harrison. He said, you showed us last week that fructose can increase your risk. So should people, um, be cutting back on fruit as well. Yeah, so fructose is a sugar. It's a six carbon sugar, just like glucose is a six carbon sugar. You put them together, you get sucrose. That's a dimer or a, uh, a disaccharide, I think is a better way of saying it. Uh, polysaccharides are many sugars put together. Monosaccharides is just one sugar. And yeah, so fructose is found in fruits and things. What, what we were talking about in our update, the last update, was that high fructose corn syrup or syrup with high fructose in it 
will in, in substances has been shown to increase oxidative stress. And the reason for that is because we believe that the liver, which is the only organ of the body that can really metabolize fructose, if it's given too much at once or in too high concentrations, just like the mitochondria, the electron transport chain, if it gets too many reducing compounds, you can get hydroxy radicals and reactive oxygen species. The, the same is felt for fructose. And so the question is, is does that happen as well in fruits? Because fructose is in fruit, let's face it, but probably not as high in concentration as we see it. So just give you a little bit of perspective. One can of soda um, has non-diet soda has about 16 teaspoons of sugar in it, 16. So that's, that's a lot more sugar than you're going to get in an apple or an orange or a pear or something like that. That's first off. Second off is let's not make this very, very common mistake that we make in science. And we've made it several times. And that is that the, we believe that the effect of a substance is directly related to the structure of that substance and that substance only. And that's a mistake. And we've made that mistake several times. I can think of a most notable mistake that we made in terms of lung cancer. So many years ago, they noticed that patients with lung cancer seemed to do better when they had diets high in vitamin E and vitamin A. And so scientists said, hey, well, maybe we're onto something. Maybe we need to give more vitamin E and A in lung cancer patients. So they looked at these fruits and vegetables that these lung cancer patients were finding. They found high levels of vitamin E and A. They extracted them. They took them out of their environment in those fruits and vegetables. So they were no longer complexed with those things in fruits and vegetables. They isolated it. They purified it. They put it in a pill and they gave it in high doses to lung cancer patients. And guess what happened? These lung pa patients, lung cancer patients died faster than those that didn't take it. And so that, that's the major, that's a major problem there is making this assumption that fructose in high fructose corn syrup is going to behave exactly the same as fructose in a fruit and vegetable. Um, it's not, uh, we know it's in a different environment. For instance, sucrose, um, is yeah, it's half glucose and half fructose, but it's bound to each other. And so it takes time for that bond to be cleaved. And so therefore you're not going to be getting fructose available for metabolism as quickly. It's going to be more of a slower process when it's in the form of sucrose. We know that in fruits and vegetables, fructose is complex in complex carbohydrates. And so it takes a while for that to get digested out of the fiber that it's mixed with in the fruit. And so the, the danger may be in fact in, in so much of the fructose, but in the fact that it's available immediately in high doses. And that may be the issue uh, with, with fructose. And so, um, you know, we've looked at this, uh, when I say we, Medcram hasn't looked at this, uh, scientists have looked at it. And when they look at patients, subjects who eat diets rich in fruits and vegetables, in fact, the surrogate markers for oxidative stress are in fact lower in those patients uh, than they are in patients who don't have that kind of a diet. So certainly the evidence is not there that fruits and vegetables with fructose is going to cause the same kind of damage oxidatively as uh, syrup with, with uh, fructose in it that's not complex. Great. Well, a lot we could follow up on there, but uh, I'll move on to a different comment and see if I can bring it up. And this is from Ron Lewis. And he said, what is the role of systemic steroids and or budesonide nebulizer in COVID patients, especially early in the disease? Yeah, so early in the disease, um, good question. Very early in the course of this pandemic, we got very clear recommendations from the WHO, CDC, stating that we should avoid steroids in COVID-19. And the reason for that was because we had data in influenza that showed that when you gave steroids in those patients, that it simply prolonged the viral shedding process. And so while we didn't have data in COVID-19 or in coronavirus, the data seemed to indicate that that wasn't a good thing to do. That has really stuck because there's not a lot of groups that are giving steroids. But now when you look at the fact that COVID-19 is, is not just a bad influenza, in fact, it's, it, it's a very different type of viral infection. 
it seems to be affecting the vasculature. It seems almost as though these patients have a vasculitis. And we all well know, those of us that treat vasculitis, that the cornerstone of treatment in those kind of conditions is steroids. So should we give it or should we not give it? You know, I haven't seen a lot of centers doing it. I know the math plus, M-A-T-H plus, we talked about that last time. Um, this is the uh, uh, Paul Merrick group out of uh, Virginia, Eastern Virginia. They simply are, are doing that. They're advocating it. I, I'm really interested to see, and I'm optimistically hopeful here that uh, there will be some data that comes out. As of right now, it's a hunch. We don't have randomized controlled data for either systemic steroids or budesonide. Budesonide is a very commonly used inhaled corticosteroid for the lungs. Um, interestingly, if this truly is a systemic vasculitis that we're seeing, I would advocate not for budesonide in a nebulized treatment, because I don't think that's gonna go to where, this, where it's needed in the, in the vasculature. Instead, I would indicate for high dose you know, systemic steroids. Um, that's not to say, Kyle, that we're not using it. I have plenty of patients with COVID-19 that are hypotensive. They are on vasopressors. And as a result of that, because of that fact, we typically do use steroids in those kind of patients. So we'll put them on hydrocortisone 50 IV Q6. And, um, and I have a patient, uh, actually right now that I've, I've, we've done that on the patient has gotten off of vasopressors and we're tapering those steroids down, but he went from 80% oxygen requirements to now just 35% oxygen requirements. And so that's a phenomenal improvement. I don't know if that's all from steroids or from all the other treatments that we'll be talking about shortly. And we're looking forward to the results from that uh, recovery trial out of the UK from um, Oxford University with uh, dexamethasone is one of the things that they're uh, studying. And they have over 11,000 participants in that study. So it'll be interesting to see those, those results. Yep, that'll be that'll that will tell us. Uh, and I think if that is a positive study, you're going to see people jumping on that very quickly. Excellent. Okay, moving on. Let's see our next comment here. This is from Lawrence, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but he says um, basically no health problems other than a tiny bit overweight. He's 65 years old, and the question is, when they say that a 65 year old is at greater risk, is age in and of itself enough? to increase the risk? Yeah, so it is. Uh, but realize uh, when I go see a 65 year old, there's 65 year olds that look like 85 year olds and there's 65 year olds that look like 45 year olds. So it's, it's, it's something that we have to latch onto because it's universal, it's age. Uh, but at the same time, you know, someone's 65 is another one's 45 is another one's 85. And there's a, there's a broad range there. But for a given individual, 65 is probably a higher risk than 64. Excellent. Okay, and then the next question here, let me get rid of this one, is, um, I'm not even gonna try on that username here, but it says, um, on a practical level, if someone is seeking COVID-19 treatment for themselves or a loved one, can they shop around to different doctors or hospitals asking them about their ideas for treatment? Um, or is the typical hospital doctor gonna be totally restricted to hospital policy set by the administrators and or the insurance companies? Yeah, so the answer is yes, yes, and yes, uh, to some degree. The insurance companies really aren't going to be dictating much, okay? So that the insurance companies really have very little to say about the kind of medications that you use as an inpatient. That being said, your pharmacy at your hospital is really gonna be the one dictating about what medicines are being used because if they don't have them, they haven't been able to obtain them, that's gonna be a big problem. So this is how it typically works. You go to the emergency room, the emergency room doctor decides whether or not you need very quick care and whether or not you need to be admitted to the hospital. Once you get admitted to the hospital, it's the hospitalist who is the admitting doctor and the specialist that he decides to get on board that are gonna be dictating how your care is going to go. So generally speaking for COVID-19, you're gonna have a hospitalist 
That could be a doctor that just does admitting to the hospital at that particular hospital, or it could be a family care doctor, your family care doctor that admits you to the hospital, or it could be an internist, the same thing that takes care of you as an outpatient or also admits you to the hospital. But once you're there in the hospital, that doctor and also a usually a pulmonary critical care specialist and also an infectious disease specialist are going to get together. They're going to make some determinations about what is going to be your treatment. One of the mainstay treatments right now, at least where I am working and mostly in the United States, is remdesivir. So remdesivir is that medication that was recently FDA approved for COVID-19. It's one of the only few that have been uh, approved. It was fast-tracked. And that was because of a study that was stopped early because it showed improvement to recovery and also showed a trend toward statistically significant mortality benefit. It probably would have shown a mortality benefit if the study had gone on to conclusion. Uh, because it was stopped early, though, we'll, we, we won't know that. So remdesivir is a medication that's either given for five days intravenously if you're not on the ventilator or 10 days intravenously if you are on a ventilator. Um, some of the contraindications for remdesivir are poor renal function or elevated liver function tests. So that might be a contraindication to use. Another cornerstone of treatment is tocilizumab. Tocilizumab is an antibody that goes against IL-6. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's usually reserved for patients who are having worsening oxygenation. And typically it's given in a lot of hospitalized patients because let's face it, to, in order to get admitted to the hospital, you have to have some degree of worsening oxygenation. Um, that is another medication that's going to be given. Now, generally speaking, if you're not getting better after a couple of days with that, then they may consider giving convalescent plasma. This is plasma obtained from donors who had coronavirus and have now recovered and no longer have the virus, but they have antibodies. And so those antibodies can be given passively intravenously to patients who are suffering from COVID-19. The problem with that is that you have to make sure that your blood bank and there's only really one blood bank that a hospital is going to go with. And if they can't, then they might go to another existing blood bank outside of their network. If they don't have enough of that COVID-19 convalescent plasma, then it's not going to be available at least on the day that you need it. You may have to wait a few days. Um, so what are some of these uh, blood banking companies? Lifestream, American Red Cross, to name a few. There's probably different ones in your counties wherever you're listening to this. Um, but this is the reason why at our hospital, we always call our recovered COVID patients two weeks later, make sure they're doing okay, and to really enthusiastically um, encourage them to donate plasma so that we can help other patients. Um, in terms of remdesivir, we have FDA approval. We are, we're probably as well off as we know that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. As far as tocilizumab, we're, the, the data is not completely there. We don't know. We think it might work. Mm -hmm. In terms of Convalescent plasma, it's experimental at this point. The only way we can use convalescent plasma in patients is under a study protocol. And there's a, a number of study protocols that are undergoing right now, Johns Hopkins, et cetera. So not all of these treatments are the same. So if you're at a hospital and you don't know if this is happening, number one, be armed, be ready with uh, mental education so that you can ask the correct questions. And we're actually gonna be coming out with a video here in the next couple of days that'll give you that information and the questions to ask your uh, healthcare provider or your loved one's healthcare provider to make sure they're, they're doing the right thing. The point is though, is that if they're already at a hospital, the only reason why you'd be able to transfer that patient to another hospital is for a reason of basically they are not providing at that hospital what is the standard of care. And then you could, then the insurance company would pay for them to be transferred to another hospital where they could get that elevated um, standard of care. So for instance, if there was no remdesivir at a hospital, they would transfer the patient to a hospital where there was remdesivir. Now, of course, it'd probably be cheaper if they just sent a few bottles of remdesivir over to the other hospital. But that I'm using that as an example. Um, if it was because you just didn't like the doctor or it was easier for you to get to the other hospital, they wouldn't consider that a reason to transfer the patient or your loved one to another hospital. So I hope that answers that question, Kyle. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm gonna drag another question in here now. And we had a lot of questions along the lines of Sherry's question. Is SARS-CoV-2 
virus getting weaker now. Um, we've seen some recent data in, you know, coming out of Vancouver, for example, their ICU, a um, little bit over 100 patients, and actually 60% of the patients were discharged and went home. And, um, you know, obviously much better numbers than we saw coming out of New York, for example, when the pandemic first really got severe here in the United States. So what are your thoughts, uh, Dr. Schwell, on this question? I certainly hope so, <laughs> although I don't know for sure. Um, if somebody's getting better, or I should say if the populations are getting better or the numbers are getting better in terms of survival, it could be because the virus is getting weaker. It could also be that we're just getting better at handling it. It's hard to say. Uh, I certainly hope it is. It's certainly possible. We've seen it before. Um, interestingly, we just saw the opposite of that uh, in an article that was not peer reviewed that came out that showed that there was a mutation in the virus that seemed to indicate that the spikes were more stable with the, a certain mutation, especially, especially uh, a mutation that was seen in the Northeastern United States. And they thought, at least in vitro, that that virus could infect the cells better, more strongly. Um, I should note, according to the article that I read, they also saw that in the Ebola virus, but yet they didn't notice any difference in terms of reality or practicality. So in other words, they saw something in the Petri dish that did not really come to fruition in real life. That may be the same thing here. We don't know. So I guess the question is, 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 is the virus getting weaker? We don't have any evidence to say that it's the virus getting weaker. It could also be our ability to take care of it. But I hope it gets weaker. I hope it just disappears. And, um, you know, it could do that. We'll see. From, to, to build on this question, um, from the way you were treating patients at your hospital a month or even two months ago to now, would you say your treatments have gotten more targeted and in in some ways, hopefully more um, uh, efficient and efficacious? Yeah, so I can tell you that from a systems approach, from a organizational approach, we've gotten much better at treating patients. We have a, a whole unit set up to treat COVID-19 patients, both on uh, med surge, we call it, telemetry and intensive care unit. Every day at 11 a.m., we have a meeting where the pharmacy, infectious disease, pulmonary and critical care, and the hospital is taking care of the patients meet. We go over all the patients. We review how many vials of remdesivir we have left in the hospital, who has still to get it, um, whether it's a five-day or 10-day course, whether their renal function excludes them, whether or not uh, there are um, liver function tests that exclude them, what's happening with their renal function, and, uh, and so forth, whether or not they're on oxygen, which is also another criteria about whether or not they get remdesivir. We review all of the new patients coming in. So it's a very targeted approach. It's a very organizational and methodical approach. And I think because of that, uh, the, the patients are getting better treated. Certainly remdesivir is here now. We didn't have that two months ago. We didn't have available toshilizumab. And I'm saying all of these things like, like the plasma in addition to all of that, we're still doing what we did two months ago where we're hitting them with the kitchen sink. So everybody's getting vitamin C, sometimes intravenously. Everybody's getting vitamin D. Everybody's getting zinc uh, orally. And so we're, we're throwing the kitchen sink at them and doing everything that we think that we can. We're also giving uh, an acetylcysteine. So maybe it's a combination of all of these things coming together that's, that's uh, making it better. I would have to tell you that just anecdotally, I haven't seen the, the data, but I would have to say that we're, we're doing a better job now than we were two months ago. That's good to hear. Um, bringing in another question from Kyra Sutton. Much information has emerged about those who were never hospitalized but remained sick for two, three months. Do you have any thoughts about this demographic? Is this active infection this whole time or is it some type of post inflammatory um, syndrome that's going on. And I've heard some commentators even call this long haulers. I think they have a, a name for themselves. There's certain people organizing on Facebook or other social media platforms um, as kind of a support group for each other because they're experiencing this long course of COVID-19. Yeah, this is, I, I believe it's all of those things that the, the questioner suggested. This is not unusual. This is not unique to coronavirus. I've seen patients 
quite often. They come down with the influenza virus and they say, Doc, I ha I've, I've had this chronic cough for months since I got the flu. Um, and I've had this cough and this wheeze and it just won't go away. Can you make it go away? What can you do? So this is not unusual to have prolonged symptoms after a viral infection. Uh, we see that. Super and bacterial infections can be the result. Reactive airways disease can be the result. And so those should all be uh, evaluated and treated as, as they come. If it's reactive airways disease, which is not unusual, you know, taking an inhaled corticosteroid under a, under a doctor's uh, direction, coupled with a long-acting beta agonist, an inhaler, rescue inhaler, maybe even a, a, a pulse taper of steroids might be beneficial under doctor supervision. Uh, if it's related to a bacterial infection, so you would know that because you're coughing a yellow or green phlegm, then a trial of antibiotics with or without a sputum culture may be beneficial as well. But it's, it's certainly not that unusual to see these kind of patients with a viral infection. Okay. okay, another question here. You make it bigger. Erica Lloyd, my husband just tested positive, but I am negative. How could this happen? What should we both do? Well, um, assuming that you truly are negative and that he is truly positive, and I think I believe that he's positive, um, the question is, are you truly negative or not? If that's the case, you probably should isolate uh, in, in the house. So he goes to one part of the house and maybe he gets the, a, a tray of food kind of put under the table or under the door kind of thing uh, until he recovers. That would be probably the best thing to do. It just depends on you know what what your jobs are uh, about how extreme you want to be with that. But that's that's generally speaking what you want to do. It's possible that you could already have it and you're a false negative. Um, certainly, if you're having symptoms and he's positive, then there's a good chance that that's false negative. In which case, it's too late. You've already probably already have the disease. I think more importantly in terms of of isolation is is what should he be doing now. Um, Obviously, checking in with a healthcare professional, making sure he's getting all of the best uh, treatment, whatever that may be, based on his comorbidities. But uh, I would encourage you to to look and see what what I'm doing. Uh, you can go to update 59 and uh, and see what it is that we're doing. Make sure you get plenty of rest, seven hours of sleep. You need your energy. Um, try some of the hot, cold uh, contrast showers and zinc and vitamin C and all these things to strengthen. Uh, your immunity to fight uh, COVID-19. But um, if it gets to the point where you're having shortness of breath and things of that nature, definitely need to go to the hospital and be checked out. And speaking of, uh, Roger, what you're taking personally, and this is not necessarily, again, what everyone should take, you're not giving medical advice, but one of the supplements yeah. that you you personally are taking is uh, NAC, um, N-acetylcysteine. And a lot of questions coming in about NAC. Um, some people that have been taking it for a long time prior to this pandemic. Some people saying, you know, wondering about the side effects of it. Are, could there be side effects? Some people even mentioning, I'm getting a little heartburn taking NAC. So for those who are new to this channel, what are some pros and cons that you can think of um, for the supplement NAC, which is over the counter? So the fact that NAC is over the counter should tell you that the side effects profile is pretty minimal. Um, uh, although some people do have some side effects with it, obviously you don't want to be taking it if you're allergic to it, or if it, if you notice you're getting heartburn, that might be a, a sign to say, well, maybe hold off on that and see if the heartburn goes away. But no, it's 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 pretty well tolerated. There was a study that was done in 1997. This is how I got onto this and how it got my attention, where they gave it to patients with um, the flu. Actually, they gave it to patients heading into a flu season. And after about three, four, five months, they went back and checked them again. And they found that it, it did not do anything in terms of reducing the incidence of influenza. So both groups, the group that got it, in terms of how much it was, it was uh, 600 milligrams twice daily, um, orally, versus those that didn't get it, no difference at all in the amount of influenza virus or the amount of times they got the influenza virus. Where the difference came down to, though, was in the severity of symptoms. So those that were on NAC had about 25% of the influenza cases with, with symptoms that were bad enough to keep them home. 
Whereas those that didn't take it, it was about 75% of those that um, had it, uh, that w kept them home. So that's about a 50% reduction in terms of symptoms. So that's pretty strong. That's a number needed to treat of two, which is a pretty low number. And notice they took this medication throughout the entire winter season. And really in that article, there was really no reported adverse events. So, you know, I'm sure it's possible that you could have an adverse event from taking 1200 milligrams a day of n acetylcysteine but um, I'm not aware of those uh, incidences. Certainly, if you're having heartburn, you might want to stop it. And again, it's something that I felt, for me at least, because of my high exposure in this environment to influenza and also to coronavirus, et cetera, that it makes sense for me to, to take it. It's also an antioxidant. And also, Kyle, that something that sort of connected with our hypothesis of von Willebrand's factor and the disulfide bridges that form the uh, polymer, pol polymers of von Willebrand's factor is the fact that and acetylcysteine has an SH group on it that can cleave those disulfide bonds and break those up and potentially uh, mitigate some of the, um, the uh, coagulation factors. We don't know for a fact, but uh, it seems like it's a reasonable thought process. And any thoughts on dosing, a uh, dosing range for NAC? Or well, in that study in 1997, it was 600 milligrams twice daily. So 600 POBID, we call it or 1200 milligrams a day in, in, in divided doses. And so that's, that's what I've gone with. And I think you'll notice that most medications, or sorry, most formulations of N-acetylcysteine that you can buy over the counter will either come in six or 500 milligram tablets okay. or capsules. Okay, bringing another question in here. And um, this is from Marilia Vasquez. What are your thoughts about vaccine attempts, especially with the ability to find a vaccine in the first SARS outbreak. Yeah, they weren't able to do it. That was also an RNA virus. The thing about RNA viruses that make it difficult is something we'll be talking about later. Um, HIV, um, the HIV virus also is an RNA virus. And why weren't we able to get a vaccine for HIV? Well, the answer is simple, glycans. We haven't talked about glycans, Kyle. We, we will be. I'm still researching this topic. It's an amazing topic. It's going to blow your mind when we get to it. And I want you to think about the proteins that we've been talking about, proteins such as uh, the SARS-CoV-2 interacting with the ACE2 receptor. Those are proteins. And we, we think of them as very simple docking proteins that just sort of dock, and that's all there is to it. We're actually... If, if the docking mechanism is the Christmas tree, the glycans are the Christmas ornaments or the Christmas decorations. So these are little things that get peppered all over this stuff, and it can enhance or diminish binding capacity. Glycans, sialic acids. These are things that we're going to talk about because they are important. And to the degree about an RNA vaccine for coronavirus, the problem that they've been having with the HIV virus, is that HIV covers itself in these glycans. And so the antibodies really can't see them. It's almost like a silent virus. And that's the problem that we have with the ACE2 receptor and potentially coronavirus is these glycans that cover things. Makes it difficult to form antibodies and, and potentially vaccines. So we'll see. Um, news this week, Johnson & Johnson which is looking at a vaccine, uh, just announced that they are speeding up their phase one slash two trials. They were gonna be in September, now they're gonna be starting in July. So I think there is a tremendous amount of pressure and it's because of Operation Warp Speed to get a vaccine out by the end of the year or by the beginning of next year. How fast that happens, what corners we cut, and how, what are the ramifications of that, I should say, still remain to be discovered, still remain to be seen. The Moderna company that is looking at the RNA virus vaccine, the RNA vaccine, is doing animal trials at the same time that it's doing human trials in parallel. And so that is an interesting thing that really we haven't seen before. So there is a tremendous amount of capital 
of workforce going into getting a vaccine very, very quickly. And I think obviously we all know the reason why that is, is because a lot is riding on that. We need to get back to some sort of level of normalcy. And the only way that's gonna happen is if there's a vaccine. My hope is, is that it's a good quality vaccine. Right now, we don't really have much data to go on. Thank you for that, Roger. And Stephen here has a question. Have you seen any correlation between blood type and disease strength? Is anyone looking at this as far as you know? Yeah, there was a non-peer-reviewed article that came out very early in the pandemic that showed that type A blood was the worst in terms of survival uh, benefit. It, it was not a huge difference, but there was a difference, and it was statistically significant. It, that was an interesting uh, finding because we uh, looked at that hypothesis in our, or we looked at that result in our hypothesis regarding von Willebrand's factor because those people with type O, which had one of the best survival rates, had the lowest amount of von Willebrand factor available. And so it seemed like it fit very nicely into our hypothesis. So yes, it has been looked at. I don't believe it's been peer reviewed as yet. I don't even know if it's been published but it's, it's there in med archive and you can still find it if you go look for it. Seems like it was done fairly well. It wasn't done at just one Chinese hospital. It was done at multiple Chinese hospitals and the same results came as a result of that. It'd be interesting to see if that held up here in the United States. Um, blood typing is becoming an issue with the treatment of COVID-19 because when you give convalescent, convalescent plasma, it has to be typed to the blood type of the patient because of antibodies and things of that nature. So that is becoming an issue only because you have to get the right plasma for, for patients. But in terms of prognosis, we haven't really looked at that as deeply as yet, but it may be related to our hypothesis that we've come up with. And speaking of convalescent plasma, you may have mentioned this earlier. Is there enough, enough convalescent plasma at your hospital to give every patient that you think needs it, uh, that treatment? Yes and no. So earlier this week, we did not have it available for a number of patients for about a day or so. And then all of a sudden I came back in the next day and they told me, oh, we got plasma for everybody. So it's, it's a hit and miss type of thing right now, at least for us. I have a friend that works at another hospital in LA County. He's saying we're having, having no problems at all getting convalescent plasma. Um, the thing that's very important if you're in the United States and you're using convalescent plasma is that you need to sign up for a scientific protocol. Your hospital needs to do it. You will get a number from the CDC. I think it's the CDC or the FDA, one of those two. Um, and, and literally, I one night applied for this because I wanted my patient to get it. And I was at the phase where I actually had to apply on an individual basis for my patient to get it. And it required me filling out a form. Not, you didn't have to put the patient's name, just gave them basically a little bit of a history about what the patient had, uh, if they were on the ventilator, how sick they were, what you've tried, what you wanted to do. And literally, I've never seen this before. Within two hours, I had a, an email response back stating that, yes, you were approved for plasma, here is the number. And I was to take that number and give it to the, my local blood bank and they would release the convalescent plasma. At the time, of course, we didn't have it. So I had to wait some period of time to get it. It seems as though now we were waiting about a week, about a month or two ago to get it. Now we're getting within a, a day or two. So um, at least in where I am working here in Southern California, we're not having too much difficulty getting it. Certainly in parts of, of Los Angeles County, I'm hearing that they're having no problems getting it. And I think as more and more people come down with the virus, recover, and know that they can donate, I think we're going to have uh, even more convalescent plasma. It'll be interesting to see. I'll, I'll note this again. We don't know if it works yet, okay? That's why we're doing it. We're doing the trials. This is an experiment. Um, we feel it should work. We have every reason to believe it should work. This, this works in a dozen other viruses and, and diseases. But for COVID-19, we don't know how well this works. But we're doing it. And sticking with the treatment questions, um, Tassi, Tassi Lizumab, you mentioned that earlier, that you are using that at your hospital for certain patients. So besides, let me see if I have this right. Besides remdesivir Tassi, and Tassi Lizumab, 
other treatments are mostly supportive, right? Maybe use steroids in some patients, uh, certainly oxygen treatment for, for patients that need it. Any other medications that you're using at your hospital at this time? So I'm glad you said that because I, I really wanted to emphasize one other treatment that is just amazing, uh, that is working so well, and it's available in every single hospital. And you're like, what is it? What is it? It's proning. Proning position is, is amazing. I, I've had a patient here in the last couple of days. Uh, she was a young lady, and uh, she was not doing well. She was recovering. She was getting better. She was on high flow oxygen. High flow oxygen is where there's a nasal cannula and uh, it's a little bit larger. And we're putting in about 40 liters a minute of 100% oxygen flow. And she was laying on her back. We finally got, we had to finally put her on a BiPAP mask. That's a, a non invasive mask. And she was laying flat and saturating 89, 90, 91. That correlates with a PaO2 of about 60. And what, sure enough, when we got the blood gas, her PaO2 was about 60, 60 millimeters of mercury. Normal should be 80 to 100, and she was at 60. So we know that proning works. We, we really encourage patients. Obviously, if they're intubated and they're sedated, they don't have a choice. We just flip them over and they stay the way they are in the prone position. Prone positioning is with the belly down. You're laying face down on the bed. But when these patients are awake, Kyle, and they're on a nasal cannula or BiPAP, they, they can obviously choose how they want to lie. And so what we've been doing to them is telling them, you know, explaining to them why it's so important for them to prone themselves and stay that way. Well, this particular lady was a little bit resistant to that suggestion. Um, and she thought she was proning, but she really wasn't proning herself as well as she should be. So we all went in there and really told her, look, if you don't do this, you're going to be ending up on the ventilator because there's nothing else left for us to do with this BiPAP machine. You, you really do need to turn over and get on your belly. And we did it right there. And, do you know, within minutes, her oxygen saturation went from 89, 90, 91 to 100 percent saturation. When we got the blood gas to see what it was, her PaO2 went from 60 to well over 200. 250. I have never seen that dramatic of an improvement. But really what we think is going on is the fluid and the inflammation in the lungs are settling out at the back of the lungs where there's more tissue. Your back, your lungs are much more, uh, much more volume in the posterior aspect of your lung than in the anterior aspect. So when you're laying on your back, a lot of that fluid goes down and prevents oxygen from getting into your bloodstream. And so what happens is when you flip over, because the blood pressure in your lungs is so much lower than it is in your systemic circulation, gravity plays a much higher role as to where that blood goes. So when you flip over on your belly, instead of the majority of the blood going to the back or the posterior aspect of your lungs, it's now going to the, um, to the anterior portion of your lungs, which is not really affected as much because all the fluid is at the back and the blood is now going to the front, there's a much better exchange of oxygen. And, and, and eventually what happens is that that uh, fluid that was up there in the upper portion of your lungs start to slowly start to come down. And that's when you're able to flip them back over on your back a number of hours later. So what this allows us to do, Kyle, is it allows us to buy time so that we don't have to put them on the ventilator. In this particular case, this lady's uh, labs looking at ferritin and CRP, these are inflammatory markers. They were all coming down. And so I anticipate that in the next couple of days, she's going to make a much better recovery. What we just avoided doing is putting her on a ventilator, which obviously she didn't need to do. We just need to get her flipped. So what I am really, really, really suggesting and really working with our nurses and our physicians and our patients is when they come in and they're on oxygen, for COVID-19 is to self prone or awake prone. This is really important if you want to avoid intubation. And I think the more people understand that when they get to the hospital, if they have COVID-19, they'll be doing this on their own. It's, it's so important for them to be proning themselves, laying with their face down or their, their, their belly down as much as they possibly can um, when they're in the hospital. I'm going to pull in a picture here of proning just so folks that may not be 
aware of it can see what we're talking about. And, you know, it's simply just lying on your belly. Is there in the hospital setting, is there any type of special equipment or apparatus that helps them stay in that prone position longer? Yeah, there is. Uh, we, we have a, if they, if they have a BiPAP mask on, for instance, like this particular lady did, it, it's not easy because you've got this plastic mask that's coming out. It's not easy to lay down and have this thing. You got to kind of sleep with your head to one side or the other. So what they have is this uh, proning pillow. And really what it is, it's, <laughs> it's for pregnant women who want to have like a back massage. And it's got these cutouts for various protrusions that, that there might be, uh, including one for the face, so that your face, can, you can imagine a massage table. Your face goes into a, a hole and there's enough room for the BiPAP mask. They really can't move too well once they're in that position. So that is that is one thing that is a little bit of a disadvantage if, they, if you have to move them quickly because of some problem, it's a little bit harder to do it. But nevertheless, uh, they can they can lay down. Obviously, if they don't need the big hole cut out for the belly because they're not pregnant, you could always fill it with towels. Um, but uh, it, it is helpful and we're becoming very resourceful in terms of trying to find better ways to get patients to prone and to do this. And I think the best way to do it is to simply educate them. Look, mm -hmm. if you can spend the next couple of days proning, then maybe we can avoid putting a tube down into your lungs. It's, it's, it's quite impressive. It's quite impressive, the difference in oxygenation. Do you think there's any role for proning at home? Patients that aren't short of breath, but have some type of respiratory illness, a bronchitis at home, do you think proning has some role there? I think, I don't know for sure, but I would say I would expect that proning is going to help people with that actually have airspace disease. What I mean by that is they have a pneumonia. Their alveoli has fluid in it. If it's just a bronchitis where there's inflammation of the bronchial tubes, I don't expect that to really be beneficial. Um, if patients have airspace disease, have pneumonia, yes, they would probably benefit from proning. But at the same time, if that's going on, they probably shouldn't be at home. They should be going into the hospital to be checked out because they're probably going to be needing supplemental oxygen at that point. So, um, and if that's the case, they really shouldn't be staying at home because their oxygen saturation is pretty low. Uh, if you want to know for sure, you would have to buy a pulse oximeter, which you can buy for 30 bucks um, on any kind of uh, shopping website. I suspect, based on my check a uh, number of weeks ago, that those are pretty hard to find right now because they're a pretty popular item. So if you don't know, you can always look at your lips in the mirror or have someone look it up for you and if, see if they look a little bit more blue. Uh, also, your tongue is a great way. Stick your tongue out and just look at it. Um, that's how they used to do it before they had pulse oximeters. That's what my mentor in pulmonary told me many years ago. Uh, but if, if that's uncomfortable, or if you don't know how to do that, you don't feel like you can do that. If you're short of breath, go get checked out. Great. I'm bringing another question here. This is from inspired clips. And the question's about, uh, this individual needs to be on 10 milligrams prednisone twice a day for another medical problem. And so I, I want to expand their question into, um, First of all, what are the, the potential dangers with the pandemic going on of people that need to be on steroids like prednisone, like, like dexamethasone for other reasons, maybe a really severe, even poison oak, you know, rash and you need to get on prednisone. Um, and um, could you speak a little bit more to the pros and cons of using steroids like dexamethasone um, as part of the treatment algorithm with COVID-19? So we don't know, or we haven't seen, or I haven't seen, there are any reported data that shows that people who are on immunosuppressants for various conditions, autoimmune conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, things of that nature, are at any increased risk for being hospitalized with COVID-19, for COVID-19. Uh, does it mean that they won't contract it? or contract it more frequently or less frequently. We don't know. I haven't seen any data. Certainly, I'm not seeing that in the hospital. The patients that I'm seeing in the hospital are not patients like this. The patients that I am seeing are patients with kidney failure, patients with diabetes, patients with coronary disease. 
these are the patients that I am seeing. These are patients that are overweight, things of that nature. I am not seeing patients with RA, SLE, things of that nature. Um, so that being said, if they're on chronic steroids, the problem that you could run into, and you would have to recognize this as a physician, is that when you are on chronic steroids, the organ of the body that makes steroids, essentially the adrenal cortex, doesn't make them because they're, it's being given to you. So it doesn't need to make it. And as a result of that, it shuts down production. When it shuts down production, it cannot easily restart production on demand uh, for any reason. And so multiple times when a patient is under stress, for instance, if they were to have COVID-19 and they would be admitted to the hospital and they would have to have a faster heart rate because they have a lower oxygen. This is a stressful situation. Normally, the adrenal cortex would simply ramp up production of steroids in these stressful situations. But because these patients are on chronic doses of prednisone or dexamethasone, their adrenal cortex cannot do this. And so it's important for the physician who's admitting these patients to the hospital to realize that, to understand that, and to give them what we call stress dose steroids. So even though they may be on 20 milligrams a day, for instance, of prednisone, Obviously, they're going to be needing a lot more than that in the current context because of the stress of the situation, because of the stress on the human body. And so putting them on something like hydrocortisone, 50 milligrams IVQ6 would not be unheard of. And uh, we would taper down from there back to, not to off, but back to their stable prednisone dose that they were on uh, when they first came in. And that would happen over a period of a week or two. So that's an important thing to understand. Um, what are the dangers of steroids, as you uh, asked? So when every time you put somebody on chronic steroid therapy, whether it be for prednisone, SLE, uh, eosinophilic pneumonia, sarcoid, whatever it is, there is a risk of the common side effects that we see with chronic steroid use. That would be cataracts, diabetes, thinning of the stomach, uh, causing ulcerations, um, avascular necrosis of the hip. Uh, all of these things, thinning of the skin, all of these things are osteoporosis. So these are the, the common things that we would see with steroid use. And that is why we don't like to go to it unless we absolutely have to. And when we do, we try to taper it down as, as quickly as we possibly can. And that's what we would do if it turns out that steroids are beneficial for patients in COVID-19. It would be a pulse and then a taper to off unless, of course, the patient needed it for some other condition. Great. Thank you, Roger. Here's a, a simple question from Patricia Hoke. Why aren't we treating earlier in general? And I'll add a thought to that. It's been in the news a lot about these antivirals and how they work in other diseases that we're familiar with, like influenza. We know that the common influenza treatments, uh, antivirals need to be given in the first couple of days of symptoms, otherwise they're ineffective. Um, so why aren't we considering antiviral treatment, but other treatments earlier in the course of COVID-19? Well, the simple answer to that, Kyle, is simply because we don't have enough medication. We just don't have enough medication. If we, if we did, anytime you go back earlier and earlier in the case of a particular coronavirus patient or COVID-19 patient, you're going to be dealing with exponentially more people. So if you decided to say that anybody who had symptoms and was tested positive for COVID-19, now you're talking about a population of potentially millions of people. Um, some of these people, most of these people, it could be argued, are never going to need to be on a medication. They're going to get better on their own. Um, so when you, when you are waiting to give a medication to somebody, it's not because you are interested in the best timing of the medication. It's because you are trying to ration the medications that you have for the people that you need to treat. And that is the reason why we are reserving, for instance, remdesivir in the hospital for people who are on supplemental oxygen. In fact, in that article that, that came out where they looked at the data that gave remdesivir the FDA indication, interestingly enough, it showed that it was the patients that were on oxygen in, in, in the nominal form. So I mean nasal cannula that were the ones that reacted the best to remdesivir and the placebo-controlled trial. And in fact, it was those on the ventilator, albeit it was a smaller population, subset of population, 
that really showed no difference between remdesivir and placebo. But why are we giving it to patients? Why are we reserving it for patients who are very sick and on ventilators? It's because that's a smaller population of people and we have a very limited supply of remdesivir. If we had an unlimited supply of remdesivir to be given out, like Tamiflu kind of, right? We've had time to ramp up the production of Tamiflu. Absolutely, you're right. We want to give it as soon as we possibly can, as soon as the symptoms come on, because we believe that's the best time it's going to work. We just don't have as much as, as Tamiflu, though. That's the problem. And it's these antivirals for COVID are not uh, in, in pill form, correct? Yeah, that's the other. <laughs> thank you. That's the other practical thing is remdesivir is a intravenous infusion. So it's you'd have to go into an urgent care, have an IV, and it's given over five days on a daily basis, so you'd have to have this treatment five days in a row. And when 80%, arguably 90% of the patients who get coronavirus recover fully without having to go to the hospital, that uh, just seems like it's it's not a good use of that uh, medication. Right. So once we get more of that remdesivir, I think we're gonna be using it on patients coming into the hospital uh, you know, with just mild symptoms. That's kind of where we are right now, actually. Uh, but there are some issues specifically with remdesivir that make it not a wise choice to use in patients, for instance, with significant renal disease or elevated liver enzymes. Yeah. Um, the other treatment that we've mentioned a little bit so far is tocilizumab, um, difficult to say. Could you give, you mentioned it's an IL-6 inhibitor. Do you want to save the explanation for how it works for a video or can you give a real brief Cliff notes. We can do both. Yeah. Works. So basically, IL-6 is a um, interleukin. That's what IL stands for. And it basically stimulates immune system, uh, the stimulates the immune system in a bad way. Um, uh, we see this often in inflammatory cytokine storm. What a tocilizumab does is <clears throat> it's basically an antibody that binds and messes up that connection. It doesn't allow the, the binding site on interleukin-6 to hit its receptor and trigger the uh, inflammatory and immune response. And so in patients who have very bad pneumonia, bilateral pneumonia with positive, um, with a, with a positive uh, COVID-19 test, who is not improving, they're getting worse on the ventilator, or they're getting worse, requiring increasing oxygen requirements, tocilizumab is, an, um, is a great medication to give it a try on, at least theoretically. Again, we haven't seen the data yet. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll get you out of here on this question, Roger. This is from ASMR people. Is there any indication as to how long antibodies will last? If it turns out they only last for six months, what does it mean going forward? Yeah, we don't know how long it's going to last for. Some viruses can last a lifetime. Like look at uh, MMR, right? We give that when we're young and maybe a one more booster and then we've got it. We don't need to take it anymore. And the antibodies speaking. specifically remember, last, last for a lifetime, correct? Not the virus. With the, the, the antibodies, yeah. yeah. The antibodies last for, last for a lifetime. I mean, generally they should. Some people they don't. There's exceptions to that. Um, I'm not sure if the antibodies are going to last a lifetime or the, the effect of the antibodies are going to last a lifetime. It's unclear because the virus could mutate to the point where the antibodies are no longer effective against the epitope. It's all speculation. We just don't know. Uh, we will find out. And uh, my anticipation is that even if the antibodies don't last a lifetime or they only last six months, I just have the feeling that I can't see the next reaction being as as violent or as rigorous uh, as the first because you would imagine that there is some immunity there. It may not be complete, but there might be some immunity like we see with cold viruses. Um, Cold viruses, we get them eventually, but they're not severe. They don't send us to the hospital. And that's because we've seen these coronaviruses, even though they mutate, and we might not have antibodies to them, rhinovirus, coronavirus, things of that nature. What's different about this is we've, ever, we've never really seen this before. This is, a, uh, this is a SARS virus. And this SARS virus um, was locked down uh, back in 2002. The world never really saw it, just a, a very small percentage of the population. It was very severe. Uh, but however, now it's, it's, it's different. And uh, a lot of the population is seeing it and they're all seeing it for the first time. So I've got to believe 
part of me, this is expert opinion, okay, so this is a really low level evidence. I think even if those antibodies are only effective for about six months, it's possible then that you could get infected again, but I, I have a doubt that it's going to be as strong as the first time. Great. Well, Roger, thanks so much for your time and uh, joining the Q&A. Any last parting words you want to say before we sign off? Uh, no, just uh, watch for more videos this week. I'll be back in the ICU again. Um, and uh, uh, watch out for a video this week that we'll be talking about what kind of questions to ask your healthcare provider if you have a loved one in the hospital and kind of how to navigate that, uh, that world. So watch for that coming up this week and uh, join us at medcram.com. Yeah. Yeah, I'll second that. Join us at our, our website because we, we do cover a lot of other topics besides coronavirus that you may find helpful and interesting. So thank you all for joining us tonight and for all your questions and comments. And we'll hope to see you in another week. All right. Thanks, Roger. Have a good night. Thank you.